This is the TRS-80 Model 1. This is the oldest computer I own. This one was made in 1979. This was not a computer that I owned new. I bought this for my collection about 10 years ago. I pulled it out of storage just recently to find that it had a problem with one of the video RAM chips. The characters on screen were not what they should have been. I since replaced that chip and the system's working quite well now. Remove the program from tape. And you can see the signs of it loading here. And there we go. The cassette unit here is a Tandy CCR81. The power cord connected to that is not original. That's just one I had laying around. I have an owner's manual here for a CTR80, not an 81. But they're very similar. This one has a pull-out carry handle. And uh, still seems to work very well despite the fact uh, that I've never replaced the belts in it. The power supply is original, though it has been opened up. It's electrical tape holding it together now. That was opened by the previous owner either to replace a fuse or perhaps just for testing. The monitor's in pretty good shape. I've never had it open. The grommet on the connection cable here is a little loose. There are a few scratches here and there, but nothing serious. The uh, back of the unit here, sticker says manufactured April 1979. This uh, UL listing sticker has come off of it, but I still have it. Here's the back of the computer, the tape input, the video output, the power input, and the power button. The cover on the expansion port, still have it, but the tabs that snap it in have broken off long ago. Here's the reset button. There are a few scratches along the front of it here. With normal wear and tear, nothing too bad. All the keys on the keyboard still work. No problems with the keyboard at all. Here's the bottom of the computer with the serial number sticker. The date codes on all the chips inside say 1979 as well. And I had to break the seal on it to get in and replace that RAM chip. Though I don't think it's the first time someone's been in there. And I even have the manual for it, the level 2 basic manual. It's got some setup instructions connecting the recorder. A lot of reference material in here. Time to take the old uh, TRS-80 apart. This will be the first time I've ever opened it up. I'm going to take a look at the RAM chips, the capacitors. Hopefully there's nothing underneath the sticker or the rubber feet. over on this side is removed. I don't know what's uh, holding it. There we go. Let's see what we got. There's a keyboard connector. The screws are holding on a heat sink.
spacers are holding the board on. I don't know if they've been glued in place or if they're just stuck on there good. There we go. The A just got them stuck. I'm gonna do this off camera. I finally got those spacers off. So here's the board. The electrolytics look okay uh, at first glance. There's a few cobwebs in here. Some of the chips look a little iffy. They don't look like they're seated properly. I'll take a closer look at this one here and take a close look at the whole board with the magnifier. Well, I fixed this chip, I straightened out the pins and uh, reseated it and actually reseated all of the socketed chips actually. Good thorough visual inspection, doesn't show any obvious problems so I'm gonna flip it back over, plug it in and see if that was the problem all along. Power light, oh no. Looks like we still have a video RAM problem. Clear screen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. Those characters do not show up correctly. But they do show up correctly down here. There is some kind of an add-on board here connected via series of wires here and here. Not sure exactly what those are doing. I'll have to look that up. These are uh, the video RAM chips here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's only seven chips. One chip for each bit. Seven bits. I, uh, I had ordered these uh, replacement chips. Uh, hopefully I only need one of them, but I got a few extras. And uh, those just came in today. Uh, last night I had some free time, so I went ahead and put some sockets in here ahead of time. I was going to go ahead and socket all of them, but pulling those chips out is a bit tedious. And it also runs the risk of damaging the chips, so I decided to just socket the ones that I'm going to replace. So, I'm going to pull out bit zero right here replace it and we'll put it back in and turn it on see if it fixes it. This is the bad one. There's no notch in here but there is a dot on pin one so I'm hoping I'm putting this in here in the right orientation. Put it all back together. 
and plug it in and see if it works. Fingers crossed. Memory size. It looks like it's supposed to. Wow. That fixed it. Let us uh, clear the screen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. Testing the keyboard, making sure all the keys work. E H J K L C V B N M. Little key bounce there. And the shift key on this side. And the shift key over here. Before I button it all up, I just wanted to uh, take a quick tour of the inside. This is the uh, ribbon cable that connects the keyboard, and this is something I always worry about breaking when I open it up. This board here, I figured out, is the level 2 basic mod. This runs over the other side here with this ribbon cable and connects to this ROM socket. So this is connecting address lines and data lines to these chips here. So there's two ROM sockets over there and my guess is that they uh, ran the ribbon cable over here so they could have three ROM sockets instead of only two. And then uh, use these other wires here to connect the additional address and data lines that they needed. This one right here, I'm not too sure about. I was told by someone that this is a mod for the cassette interface that made the cassette data loading and saving much more reliable. Before I close it up, I'm going to take a look at the voltage and video adjustments on the board and adjust things as necessary. So I'm going to take a look at the... Uh, I've got the uh, printouts from the technical reference book on power supply adjustments. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it on with it upside down. Hopefully I don't have the key stuck. And <clears throat> we've got 11.9 volts. That's pretty much close enough. If it was off, we could adjust R10. And if I tweak that a little bit, you can see the voltage change there. The reference manual tells you to measure the voltages at these points. This uh, capacitor over here, this end of the capacitor is connected right to the ground plane, and this power resistor is connected to the 12-volt uh, rail. The 5-volt, it says to measure from the left side of R4, and over here we should be getting 5 volts. And it looks pretty close. Can uh, see if adjusting it changes anything. Right at five. Pretty darn close, and who knows, my meter's not perfectly calibrated. So tolerance is plus minus five percent. Do not adjust the five volt supply until the twelve volt supply has been checked. Measure the voltage at the anode of CR2 to the left of the power switch. This is CR2. And over here. Put that on there. We're getting negative 5.1. That's within tolerance. There's no adjustment for this. So it looks like our voltages are good. Next I want to take a look at the video adjustments that are on the board before I close it up. The manual has a small basic program to type in that will set a border around the screen and then we can adjust the vertical and horizontal offsets. Hopefully I typed it in right. Let's see what it does. So we're drawing, oop, we got an error. So I'm going to fix 60 and change that X to a Y. Print out here, line 60 says X, but we're in a Y loop here. So the goal of the adjustments here is to have an equal boundary 
on the left and right side and top and bottom and honestly it looks okay to me I want to just uh, tweak these adjustments to see what they do so let's see this one moves it upward up and down and this one over here just moves this left to right so this is just a uh, screen positioning adjustment the caps a little flaky so it's wobbling a bit take the screwdriver away it looks okay so yeah those adjustments were unnecessary I just wanted to check them before I button everything back up the voltages and video adjustments are all good Wrote a little program to test video RAM. This writes to the VRAM and then reads back to uh, be sure that the value currently there is the one that was written. It's now verifying the contents and it says okay. So video RAM looks okay now. I wrote a little basic program to test system RAM as well. System RAM starts at 16896 and ends at 32767, but the basic program itself takes up uh, some of that RAM at the start and system overhead and variables take up some of that RAM at the end. So we have to start a little bit late and end a little bit early if we want to avoid overwriting the basic program and crashing it. And we're almost there. I'm writing a 255 to all of these memory locations. And I'll repeat the test again by writing a zero to make sure that we can turn all the bits off. And we're okay. Just about finished with another pass with the value set to zero to check for any bits stuck on. Okay. I was able to load a program from a WAV file through the cassette interface just by playing it on my phone. This is The Dancing Demon. I don't know what the purpose of it is really. There's no audio on the Model 1. And you can create shows. We'll do a preset show here and we'll give it a speed of 10. And one performance. Let the show begin. I was told on the message boards that this uh, this program is very good at testing all of your available RAM. Or at least that's what I heard. Seems to be working just fine. And the dance is over. And the curtain closes.